Police are appealing to the public for any information that can help locate a missing two-year-old boy. Carlos Scott Huey was left alone in a car in Flinders Street, Darlinghurst on May 22 and was later reported missing. He has not been seen or heard of since and his present whereabouts are unknown. He was one of the worst human beings that ever walked the streets of Sydney. He was a psychopath. He was a child murderer. He was just a horrible human being who ultimately got his just desserts. This is the story of the magician, Stuart John Regan. John Regan earned the nickname The Magician and it had nothing to do with his prestigious abilities. People who befriended John Regan tended to disappear. Regan was paranoid. He always feared that someone may have known too much about he, him and his activities. If he thought that, good night, Irene. At the age of 14, Regan attacked a stranger in the street and was sent to a harsh reformatory called Gosford Boys Home. Here he was on the receiving end of brutal beatings, which instead of curbing his violent tendencies, helped to hone them. To earn money, Regan became a pimp. He targeted prostitutes working in the slums and bashed them if they refused to work for him. John Regan built up a stable of prostitutes. He, he, he made quite a lot of money out of that. Um, and he controlled them through fear and violence. If they didn't hand over as much money as he thought they should have, he slapped them around, there was no doubt about that. If he found out that there was a customer who was misbehaving or wasn't paying, they'd be beaten within an inch of their lives. In January 1967, Regan, who was well known to police for assault, robbery and rape, added murder to his criminal resume. His victim was a fellow pimp and business associate called Barry Flock. Barry Flock was involved with John Regan in a car rebirthing scheme. Police arrested Barry Flock and charged him with, with possession of stolen cars and um, a bail was set at a reasonably high price. Um, now, not long after that, John Regan himself bailed Barry Flock out. Now, Barry Flock never turned up for court. Barry Flock disappeared. Barry Flock was another victim of the magician because Barry Flock knew too much about John Regan's involvement in car rebirthing. Getting away with murder set the magician on a killing spree. One of the magician's first vanishing acts was performed on Ross Christie, a partner in a women's dress shop where they used to sell stolen goods. Next was Eric Williams, whose disappearance allowed Regan to consolidate his hold on Sydney's brothels. It's believed he got away with as many as eight murders. The police were also aware of what he was doing and what his antics were, but it was incredibly hard to get any evidence against him. In fact, uh, he f I think the only time he was in jail was for a string of uh, car offences, uh, traffic offences, that uh, he was... Uh, the allegations of, uh, of assault, vicious assault, perverting the course of justice, burglary and other charges just fell by the wayside simply because you couldn't find witnesses who testified. They were too scared of him. Well, the downfall of John Regan started with the disappearance of Carlos Scott Huey. Carlos Scott Huey was the son of prostitute Helen Scott Huey, who lived with John Regan. She was his girlfriend. John Regan claimed that he'd gone to Taylor Square in Sydney at 4am to buy a newspaper. And he gave police this story that he'd just left Carlos briefly in the car while he went to get a newspaper, came back and Carlos was gone. The public, the media, the gangsters, the police had no doubt whatsoever that Carlos had disappeared because Regan had killed Carlos. The theory was Regan, who had a bad temper, was babysitting Carlos while his mother was out working, earning a quid. 
Carlos began to cry. Regan couldn't take the crying and he snapped. In snapping, he somehow killed Carlos. He dumped Carlos's body somewhere, went to Taylor Square as a subterfuge, and then contacted the police in a panic to say that someone had taken Carlos. Regan had crossed a line that the criminal milieu itself did not understand. The thing that especially abhorred both the police and indeed the other criminals of the time was that Regan then made a grab for publicity by actually offering a substantial reward for anybody who could have information about the disappearance of Carlos. Regan's heart was so cold and black that he taunted police and the boy's mother by offering up false leads as to where Carlos's remains might be found. He sent police to a house in Woolloomooloo where they found bones beneath the floorboards. I remember where he put dog bones down at the Woolloomooloo and said, oh, there's bones here, you know, probably this is where this little bloke is. He'd do that because that would, that would be his kick. You know, that, that, being a psychopath, that would be, he'd be getting a huge amount of fun out of that uh, because that's, that's how he thought. That's, that just goes to show what, what a raving bloody rat bag he was, for Christ's sake. Regan's murder of a two-year-old boy had put a target on his back. But without a body, the police were powerless to charge him. The arrogant Regan then waged a media war against the police. He was in the habit of ringing newspapers constantly, alleging that police were, were threatening to load him up with, with false evidence, to verbal him, which means uh, uh, make statements, false statements against him. It was all untrue, but this was part of Regan's tactics to put the heat on the police and keep them off his back. Killing a kid and taking on the cops was reason enough to get rid of Regan. However, it was when Regan killed ratty Jack Clark that he signed his death warrant. Clark was a good mate of Sydney's criminal godfather, Lenny McPherson. Ratty Jack accused John Regan, he was the first person to do it to his face, accused John Regan of having killed the boy. Well, not long after that, Regan shot Ratty Jack Clark. The reaction of the major crime figures like McPherson and Freeman was to uh, want some sort of justice and retribution. So a fellow called Paddles Anderson was brought into the picture. Now Paddles was a very vicious old standover man in Sydney from the 30s. By this stage, of course, he was a lot older, but he still was trading on a very substantial reputation. And he was also involved in the criminal element as a mediator, as a fix-it, as a go-to man to smooth over problems. And this was a problem. Frederick Paddles Anderson was one of the few men Regan trusted, and so he was the natural choice to entice Regan to his death. Getting close enough to murder Regan was no easy feat. With some justification, he was always armed to the teeth and seldom travelled without bodyguards. Unusually, Regan arrived at the meeting without any protection. Three gunmen stepped forward, each shot him several times, uh, and that solved a problem. While it's never been proven, it's believed that the gunmen were the men who ran Sydney at that time. Stan Smith, Lenny McPherson and George Freeman. It was a public execution on a city street a ritualised killing that sent a message to any others of Regan's ilk. The magician was shot eight times, one for each of his kills. His executioners believed they'd performed a community service for the people of Sydney. To have built up a reputation the way he had and to have been feared and despised, uh, you just can't believe that he only lived 29 years. He did all of that, all those evil things, in 29 years. And 29, he was dead. 